we started some stuff around the GFA, there's a collection of different things, you know there's a bunch of clubs playing with simulators. So what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an idea of the report that I've sent through to the GFA and some of the um, different issues, I'm not going to try and dig too deeply into it, if you want to know, the report. if you haven't got it this morning at the workshop, um, it will be available on the GFA website hopefully on Monday, yes, yeah, um, for people to have a read. It's about 30 odd pages and it's basically similar to what I'm going to do today, it's a snapshot of where simulators are and the challenges that we might have and the things which it should be really good for. So firstly, um, gliding doesn't have simulators. but almost everybody else does. So I'll give you a bit of a hi history on simulation in flying in general, not just gliding. So the documented history is that about 1910 was the first flying simulator. So remember when the Wright brothers, what was it, 1903 or so? Seven years it took them from the ad advent of powered flight to actually getting simulators. In fact, even before that, a lot of the students, when they were playing with uh, Lydian Thel's gliders, they would simulate flying there even. They would actually put them on the ridge and hold the wings and get them to move around until they got comfortable and then threw them off the ridge. This photo is actually of a French simulator at the start of World War I, when suddenly aircraft were a big thing in warfare. And so they had to work out how to get a whole bunch of pilots to actually fly and aircraft were expensive to manufacture then, like they are now, and so how do we teach people the basics of flying without actually breaking a whole bunch of aircraft. Then in World War II, bit of time forward, for those that have been in the Air Force, will recognise this photo. This is a Link trainer. It is an estimated half a million pilots went through using this trainer, or variants of this, from about 19... 29 through to about 1965 or so. In fact, the Air Force cadets here in Australia still own a bunch of them. There's one up in Williamstown and a couple of others. I'm not sure if they're still in use. Maybe Jeff can <laughs> tell us and that sort of stuff. But that was a staple of how pilots, particularly military pilots, learnt to fly for decades. And now we've got the current commercial sims. So you've got something like a 747 simulator over there, big you know, three, action, three axis motion base inside it with this you know, very high resolution cockpit, completely immersive. And it's got to the point where pilots go through their entire training in a simulator before they get into a real aircraft. In fact, in my club last weekend, one of our pilots who was a commercial EJET check captain converted to the 737. He spent all of his time in a simulator, his first flight in a real aircraft was with some 150 odd passengers in the back behind him. Yeah, which airline is he flying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's flying for Virgin. So, in fact, he's being based here in Melbourne. So, um, but that gives you a level of how far simulation can actually be in gliding, uh, or in flying in general. So, in the gliding world, we've got all sorts of things. Simulators have got to the point now where homebrew is standard. The guy on the left hand side here is a guy who built a 747 simulator himself in his own garage. Okay, That's how much the standard parts are. This is actually based up in um, Chatswood I think in Sydney. Um, and he'll actually take people in it. Casa have been in it and they've actually given him a thumbs up and certified it. Home built. Okay, not commercial go buy it from BAE or whatever or Boeing for you know, 30 or 40 million dollars. On the other end of the scale is uh, the DIY solutions. Um, in this case, there's a company or a website called Roger Dodger Aviation. You can look it up and you can buy for ten dollars of plans for building all sorts of different simulators using PVC pipe. Everything on there, you, know, you can go down to is an American thing, so it's called Home Depot, which is the equivalent of our Bunnings. You can go to Bunnings and build these simulators for you, and then work with them at home. It's actually quite fascinating if you want to have a look at his site, the, the sort of things he can do with it. So what about gliders? 
Anybody recognize this one? <laughs> the Gimli Glider. <laughs> and of course, our other famous gliding commercial aviation, yeah, Captain Sully. <laughs> he learned how to fly in a simulator and he ended up flying a glider. <laughs> We're already doing it. You guys, as instructors, actually, how many instructors do we have here? Oh, at least half the audience. You already do simulation, right? You sit there and you're explaining an error to you know, or you're saying, okay, as we're doing the circle, we're walking around here and we're looking at our aiming point. Simulation's already being used in gliding because you're doing these explanations you know, as you go without actually using a real aircraft. Or you sit in the aircraft and you get them to balance the wings before it actually takes off, you know, if you've got a nice strong headwind. So on the other side of what most people think of simulations, what's happening in the world? At home, Condor rules. So many people, like if I ask around in my club, at least half the pilots in our club, including the instructors, are using Condor. They sit at home, they have a bit of a fly during the midweek, they work on their cross-country techniques. Um, my syndicate partner, I've just bought an LS6, he'd never flown a flapped aircraft before, so he grabbed the other six model, um, no, sorry, grabbed the ASG29 model, loaded it up into Condor, and has been flying with it for the past couple of weeks to get to learn how to use a flapped glider, because we only have standard class gliders in our club, or two-seaters. By 2011, they had made their decision to introduce simulator as a standard part of the training syllabus. So for them, they then went through the entire process of actually working out what needed to be taught in simulators, working out how to get it out to all the different clubs, and so forth. They have national support. So their equivalent of the GFA basically was pushing it out and into the clubs. Another requirement is every club must have a simulator. You cannot go through gliding now in France without having spent time in a simulator beforehand, because they've worked out the value of it. And then in order to get the simulators out into each of the clubs, um, they actually have a subsidised purchase scheme. And I have a translation of this article if people are actually interested in it and that. So it's the rest of the world, and then there's France. And they have a very good model for us to have a look at. So, what about the GFA's simulation project, because there's been a few little mentions in the Australian Gliding Magazine and so forth. So what is this project about? As I said, we started last year at the AGM. Um, John Stiles was talking about using the simulators and so forth and um, somebody else mentioned something and I stuck my hand up and said, listen, I'm really interested because I like simulators and my professional background is in that area and what can I do to help? And then Mandy just basically grabbed my co by the collar and said, right, <laughs> you're off. Um, and then about three months ago, it kicked off officially with a, there's a lot of unofficial stuff going on. And I've basically talked to the world um, and grabbed uh, a lot of information which culminated in the report, which I sent off to the board at the start of the week, I think, if I can't, can't remember now been a bit of a blur. In Australia, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of clubs that have built simulators, but the cart went before the horse because from the simulation side, there's a lot of people who are on the technical side. It's like, oh, well, I've been playing with Condor at home. Oh, I wonder if I can build a simulator. Oh, oh great. Look, I've built a simulator and it works. <coughs> now, what on earth do I do with the thing? Um, as an example, Lake Keeper have built their simulator. They finished it off, I think it was two to three months ago, and I don't think anybody's used it yet. Whereas, is Anita... They're using it. They are now using it? Okay. Because I heard this morning that nobody had actually started using it yet, so... But... Last, last week, whether they using it. Yeah, great. Great. Uh, so, it's ended up being like, oh, geez, now I've got a simulator, I have to find a use for it, rather than the traditional way of things of... You can also book it for a specific time. When you say, I'm going to be there at 7.30 or 5 o'clock or whatever, the simulator is going to be there for you and waiting. 
It's not like you're going to have to show up and then, oh, yeah, sorry, I can't fly. You know, the glider's up in the air. We'll have to wait for it to come down and so forth. Another thing, we're not bound by the laws of physics anymore. So we can reevaluate potentially our training methodology. Can we train people in different ways that is much more logical than the fact that we're bound by having to take off and land on each flight? I heard one example earlier on um, of people saying, well, if I'm, when I try to teach somebody Aerotow in a, in a sim, I do a 10,000 foot launch. And by the time I got to the top of the 10,000 foot launch, they basically know where they're going. Yeah? Try doing a 10,000 foot launch and not cost you several hundred dollars in the process. You can always work in areas that are physically dangerous. Rope breaks, for example. You can do 200 rope breaks in this thing. And if you crash at the end of the runway, that's okay. It's not going to hurt anybody or anything. Similar thing, the, the other one, the low level spin on base into the ground. You can work on that sort of stuff over and over and over again. And the nice thing is you can do it hundreds of times because it doesn't cost you anything. Try doing 100 rope breaks and see how long the student complains about how their wallet is getting hit. Of course, same thing, repetitions. Um, there's a saying that goes around that in order to truly master something, you must do it 10,000 times. Somebody's not going to do 10,000 rope breaks <laughs> in a real glider. But with a simulator, they've got the option of doing that sort of thing. So if you want to get challenged, if you want to work on your proficiency in things, you can do that repetition. You're in there with a student and they're coming in and their circuit planning's all wrong. No, okay, let's stop, let's start again. Whilst they're in the middle of doing it. And of course, if they are having a problem, you can focus on that problem. You don't have to take off and land either side of that problem. You know, as I said, if they're having the flare wrong, you know, okay, let's work down final, down final, down final, oh, 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 okay, no, that didn't work this time, okay, what did you do wrong? Okay, right, boom. 30 seconds later, you're back on your final again. Of course, once you've got a marketing sim, your requirements for marketing is a little bit different to the training oriented stuff, um, particularly in the mobility. Uh, you only need a single cockpit, a few things like that, and they have to be robust of having you know, 50 or 60 people climbing in and out of an aircraft and that sort of stuff. The VSA guys can attest to the breakability of their mobile one at the moment and how much grief that causes them.